Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CATHIP Health Hour. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating, and giving space to Black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our Black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members, and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members, such as pharmacists, specialist nurses, and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell, and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious, and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you, and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences, and ask questions to our Black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our Black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. Hello, everyone. A very good morning to you wherever you are joining us from today, the 20th of August 2022. My name is Dr. Diana Asante, and I welcome you warmly to another CATHIP Health Hour today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a very seasoned and experienced consultant who will be taking us through this session. Now, she's someone who works very closely with eyes and does a lot of work with eyes. She's an ophthalmic surgeon, and she's going to be taking us through the topic of diabetic retinopathy, diabetes eye disease. Now, as you know, week in, week out on the Catholic Health Hour sessions, we bring you various topics which help to empower us, to educate us, increase our knowledge, and make us better people overall. And we have Black GPs and Black consultants, Black cl clinicians volunteering their time to come and talk to us about these salient topics. We really appreciate your time. We know you've all got busy schedules and we know that you've got um, other things to do, but you join us week in, week out, and we appreciate that. So whether you're joining us on Zoom today or you're on YouTube or Facebook or, or wherever you're joining us from, um, please make sure you engage fully. You can post your questions in the chat box as we go along. You can send the message um, to our digital assistants and we will have a Q&A session where we address these questions. Now, we try to make it as interactive as possible as well. So sometimes we also have the opportunity to ask people to unmute themselves, to ask questions or to raise their hands to ask questions. And we value your feedback. So at some point during these sessions, we send out feedback forms to gather your feedback about how well um, we're, we're, we're organizing these programs or indeed how we can improve to make it better, to make it more relevant, to make it more useful. So please do complete those feedback forms when they come around. Um, and, and also if there's anything extra you want to tell us, then you can email us at health um, at can.org.uk. So once again, the topic for today is diabetic retinopathy or diabetic eye disease. Um, now we know that diabetes is very common in general, in the general population these days, where a lot of people are, are suffering from diabetes um, and specifically type two diabetes we know is on the increase. But we also know that people of black, African and Caribbean ethnicity or heritage um, are up to three times more likely to be diagnosed um, with diabetes, type two diabetes. And therefore, if, if left unmanaged or left untreated, then complications can certainly arise. So one of the complications we'll be tackling today will be eye disease. And it's my pleasure to introduce to us Dr. Evelyn Menzer, consultant, who will be taking us through this session. Welcome once again, and over to you, Dr. Evelyn Menzer. Thank you so much for your time and for honoring our invitation. 
my absolute pleasure to be with you all this morning. Um, yes, my name's um, Evie. Um, I'm a consultant ophthalmic surgeon. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing uh, my slides so we can just um, go right into it. Um, and I hope everything is being displayed properly. So um, yes, I'm an ophthalmic surgeon, which means I'm an eye surgeon. Um, I'm based at Central Middlesex Hospital. It's a beautiful hospital um, in Park Royal um, in Northwest London. And I'm part of a larger trust called London Northwest University Healthcare Trust. And it's my absolute pleasure and privilege to be with you this morning. Um, at the uh, trust, I am the clinical lead uh, for ophthalmology. Um, I'm also the co-lead for the Northwest London sector. So that's for the whole, all um, the sector in Northwest London, which comprises eight um, hospitals. Um, and I'm also a workforce race equality standard expert. And that's another hat that I have. Um, I, de I deal with race equity uh, within my hospital trust. So the overview that I'm going to do for the talk today, and I'm really going to hope that the first part is interactive, because I think all of you who logged in this morning, you all thought you were going to come in, sit there, listening to me talk, but I'm going to start off with a quiz, and you, the audience, would, are really excited to participate in it. I know you are. We're just going to go through a little bit of eye anatomy, so we're all on the same page. I'm then going to go briefly through the prevalence of diabetes, the risk factors, what the definition of diabetic retinopathy is, because all these words that, that people hear, sometimes they don't really understand what they are. Um, if you're diabetic, you should be participating in the diabetic eye screening program. A little bit about that and what the effect of diabetic retinopathy is on your eyesight, how you can manage it. And then I'm also going to just talk a little bit about my patients at Central Middlesex Hospital and tell you a little bit about what they are eating. All right, so this is the quiz, all right? So anyway, so can anybody tell me what this structure at the front of the eye is labeled one, the window into the eye? Just speak out, put your hand up, type it in the chat. What do you think that is? Even the doctors on the call, let's ask the doctors, the doctors on this chat. Charles, I'm sure you're there. Charles, can you tell us what structure number one is? Nobody. Cornea. Cornea, whoever that is, give yourself a gold star. Fabulous. Well done. Okay. Now, everybody's got a colored part of the eye. All right. Um, but what is number two, the gap in the center? It looks black in the center of your eye. The gap. The retina? The what, sorry? Retina? Not the retina, yeah. no. This is right at the front of the eye, the gap in the middle. Gap in the middle, right? Come on, doctors. It's not a lens, is it? Um, no, the gap is a gap in the middle of the colored part of your eye. The, light the pupil? Comes. Pupil, whoever that was, is, and I bet you weren't a doctor. These doctors are very quiet today. Structure number three, all right? It's behind the colored part of the eye. You have it in a camera at the front, old fashioned 35 millimeter camera right at the front. Lens. Lens, fantastic, well done. Okay, now the colored part of the eyes, our eyes are usually brown, but what is that structure called? That's labeled number four. This one is blue in this picture. But ours are usually brown. Although my little niece's looks green. Iris? Iris! Iris, Iris. Iris is absolutely correct. Now we're getting to the tricky part. So that was all the front part of the eye. Now we're going to the back part of the eye. Does anybody know what this structure leaving the back of the eye is labeled number five? It's a bit like a wire cable, leaves the back of the eye, goes to your brain, allows you to see. Is it the retina? I got it wrong before. No, it's a narrow thing. Retina? No, it's sensitive. Optic nerve. Optic nerve. Did someone say optic nerve? Optic nerve. 
fantastic. Whoever said optic nerve, fantastic. Well done. Now, the, the structure that I've already heard <laughs> about 10 times already, this yellow one that's lining and it's got all these blood mm -hmm. vessels mm -hmm. in it. That is the mm -hmm. retina. Fantastic. All right. The retina. Number seven is hard. And they actually got it wrong in this picture. The label they put there is wrong. But does anybody know what number seven is? Oh, yeah, centrally. Oh, my gosh. It is. The, well, you see, they got it wrong. They put macula. This is the macula. macula. That is the fovea. Well done, whoever that is. So what we're talking about today is we're talking about disease of the retina. All right. And diabetes affects the blood vessels that nourish the retina. So that's what we're talking about today. Diabetic retinopathy, which is disease of the retina from diabetes. Now, the, the, the prevalence of uh, diabetes is quite high. There are about 4.9 million people in the UK who are currently living with diabetes. The most commonest type of diabetes is type 2. 90% of people have type 2, where you can modify your risk for uh, developing it. And then there's type 1, 8%, which you can't do anything about. If you're a type 1 diabetic, there's no amount of modification that you can do to get rid of it. But you can actually modify what you do with type 2. Now, the risk factors for getting um, diabetes are age, family history. And as um, Diana already said, that it's more prevalent and you're more likely to have diabetes. It's quite prevalent in our community and our Black Caribbean, Black African community. You're two to four times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than compared to those from coming from a white background. Now, if I had to define it in, in, as, in an easy way as possible, the way I would define diabetic retinopathy is it is chronic. And what I mean by chronic is it, it goes on for a long time, a long time. It can be progressive. It can be progressive if you don't control the risk factors for diabetes, which we'll talk about later. Just because you're, you've got diabetic retinopathy doesn't necessarily mean that it affects your sight, but it can be a sight-threatening disease of the retinal blood vessels. And there are two things that happen to the blood vessels. They can either leak or they can block. A bit like water pipes. You can imagine if you've got a water pipe, water pipe running under your floorboards. And if you've got a pipe that is leaky, you've got a very soggy carpet, yes? The same thing happens in the retina. And if you've got a pipe that is blocked off, well, that's not good for anyone, is it? You know, because I mean, that's just, that's like cutting off the blood supply. And the problem with diabetes is that you don't notice it. You don't have any symptoms. You're not aware of it, you as the individual, until it's far too late, which is why diabetic retinal screening or the diabetic eye screening program is one of the national screening programs. There are 11 screening programs in total, and I've just highlighted in red. There are all these other screening programs. A lot of people will be familiar with the breast screening program. They'll be familiar with the sickle cell and thalassemia screening program. And diabetic eye screening is one of the NHS screening programs. And do you know that in this country, we are the first in the world to have the diabetic eye screening program. And one of the few countries to actually have an established screening program. They don't even have a screening program in America. Anyone who is diabetic from the age of 12 onwards will have screening. And the purpose of the screening is to identify people who've got sight threatening disease before it affects their sight. So then the individual is sent on to the hospital eye service for further eye tests, where we make a decision how to support and delay progression of the retinopathy, or we may go on and give them treatment, or we may say, actually, you know what, this is very low risk, 
or it's not diabetic eye disease and we send them back into the screening program. So every year, once a year, it's an annual photographic thing that's, that actually takes place. Now, what does the retinal photograph look like? So in the screening program, we actually take about two to three pictures per eye, but I've just got one picture here. This is the optic nerve that you identified. We're looking at it head on. This is the fovea, the macula is all this area here, and these are the blood vessels. And this is a photograph of, I don't know whether there's a doctor that can tell me which eye this is. Is this the right eye or the left eye? Come on, doctors. Well, 50-50, 50-50 chance of getting it right or wrong. Come on, brave lay people who are not doctors. Which eye is it, right or left? Left, left eye. Left eye. Sorry. Uh, uh, I have actually had my gong. My da, da, right. This is the right eye. So the the nerve is towards the nose, and the fovea is towards the ear. So this is the right eye. But good guess. Good guess. Now this is a photograph of a left eye, all right, everything's swatched round. And this is an eye that has got diabetic retinopathy. So you can see it's quite different from this eye, yeah, where you can see all the blood vessels, there's no red bits and there's no yellow bits. The red bits are hemorrhages, the yellow bits, whoops, the yellow bits are fatty deposits. Because remember what I was talking about, I said that you can get blockages and you can get leakage. So when you get leakage of, your, of the blood into the surrounding retinal tissue, the, the, the serum that's released has got lipid in it, fat in it, and it leaks out and it deposits within the retina. And then the blood vessels can burst, causing these red splodges as the word described them, these red hemorrhages, and this is what can affect your eyesight. So this is diabetic retinopathy. So what is the impact of diabetic retinopathy on your vision? Well, it can make your vision quite blurred. So this picture on the left shows a healthy, what it looks like seeing with a healthy seeing eye. And the image on the right is an example of the the view that you would have in someone that had diabetic retinopathy, which I would say at this stage would be quite advanced. So we want to try and pick up patients in the screening program at this stage, if they've got any changes before they get to this stage where it's actually affecting the sight. So the things that individuals can do who have got diabetes, there are three main things that you really need to do to delay the development, and I would say the progression of diabetic retinopathy. First and foremost, to keep your diabetes under good control, reduce your blood sugar. People who are diabetic will normally have a blood test, an annual blood test, looking at their long-term uh, diabetic control, something called the HbA1c. And the HbA1c has to be within a certain level. So when you go to your GP, um, the GP will say, oh, right, um, when, you're, when they're doing the annual test, they'll tell you whether or not they feel that you've got good control or whether or not moderate or whether you've got bad control. And they may adjust your medication accordingly. The other thing that's very important in terms of diabetic retinopathy development and progression is control of your blood pressure. There's lots of evidence, lots of clinical trials looking at the effect of blood pressure control on diabetic retinopathy. And then the third thing is to control the amount of lipid, or in other words, fat within your blood. So remember on that previous picture, where it had all the fatty deposits here. Let's go back to that water pipe analogy. If, if you can imagine you're washing lots of dishes, very greasy dishes, and all the water that's passing through your pipes are very oily. If you get a, a burst 
water pipe. If you get holes in your water pipe, just say, for example, I don't know why anybody would have this, but just say, for example, you had a white carpet and you had all these water pipes under your white carpet. You would have a very soggy carpet, but also with all the fat that came out, that was deposit and, and cause a lot of damage to that white carpet. That's the same effect that's happening at the back of your eyes, all right? So just to reiterate, control blood sugar, control blood pressure, control blood fats, all right? Now, there are lots of educational materials that are out there for people who are diabetic in terms of changing their lifestyle with diet and exercise. And I have to tell you, me, myself, I went to the gym for the first time. I've never been in a gym in my life. I used to run, but I damaged my uh, medial meniscus ligaments. And so I've not been able to run. So I went with my daughter, she's 20. And to the gym is actually quite fun, actually. I didn't think it was gonna be so good. And there are all different types of machines that you can actually use. But in terms of your diet and exercise, there are lots of educational things that you can have. As a type two diabetic, you can go on the Desmond course, the diabetes education and self-management for ongoing and newly diagnosed diabetics. And for type one, the Daphne course, which is the dose adjustment for normal eat eating. They will tell you about how diet, your diet, what you eat and exercise is important for not just your whole body, but actually it's very important for your eyes and for diabetic retinopathy. Now there's no definitive trial to demonstrate the effect of smoking, but you know what? Smoking's not good for you, so you just shouldn't do it anyway. And there's evidence, and I think anecdotally, it can impact the small fine blood vessels at the back of your eyes. We always have conversations with our patients, well, I do anyway, about compliance with these lifestyle changes, keeping your appointments. I know it's very, very difficult. And especially with COVID, when everything got delayed and things got shut down. But if you're diabetic and you know you should have your appointment in screening, or you know you should have your appointment in the hospital eye service, and you feel it's been too long, please do get in contact with them. Please, please, please. And, and also just keep those appointments. Don't be scared because for a lot of the time, when you come into the hospital, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have treatment, but you might need monitoring and close monitoring. And also, if you do need treatment, thank God in this country, we have got where we have got access to free treatment because a lot of the treatment that we give for patients who have got diabetic eye disease may involve a bit of laser treatment, may involve, you know, I know it sounds really um, traumatic, injections, but it's one of the commonest treatments that we actually do in the diabetic eye clinic. And the thing is, is that I do a lot of work in West Africa. Um, I run a training program on diabetic eye disease in West Africa. And back there, if you haven't got the money to pay for it, you're not getting the treatment. So I think that we're really privileged and really lucky in this country that we've got these treatments because the treatments are quite expensive and we don't have to pay for them on the NHS. That's why I'm a huge advocate of the NHS. And there are other uh, modifiable risk factors like some people who are anemic and renal failure that can contribute also to diabetic retinopathy. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about where I work. So I work at Central Middlesex, as I said, um, the ophthalmology department serves the borough of Brent in northwest London. Um, it's the most ethnically diverse borough in London. 65% of, of our patients are Black, Asian and minority ethnic. Um, and also we serve a population of under 400,000. If you came into my eye clinic, you will see that a third of my patients will be Black, a third would be Asian and a third would be white. So I have quite a mixture of patients that come into my clinic. Now, I'm very much a um, holistic, holistic ophthalmologist, all right? I'm not just concentrating on your eyes because I know that what my diabetic patients do and what they eat 
impacts what I'm seeing at the back of the eyes. And I'm very privileged in the eye clinic. I think ophthalmology, we're very privileged because we, we, we're, we're sitting there in our rooms. We, we can show our patients their photographs. So even if their vision is not reduced, we can say, well, look at, the, look at those hemorrhages and look at that bit of fatty deposit. We really need to get that. Sorry. Oh, I thought someone said something. All right. Um, so we can we can show our patients exactly what we can see when we're looking at their eyes. So I created this questionnaire for all the patients when they come into the eye clinic. They're supposed to come with it already filled in, but usually invariably they've not done it. So the nurses <laughs> used to um, ask the questions. So we will ask questions like, what their blood sugar level is like. This is a reasonably good patient because they knew what their HbA1c was, 45, very good. If they don't know their HbA1c, we'll do a finger prick test and check what it is. We ask them what their last blood pressure was. They'll usually tell us. If they don't, we'll just say, was it normal or is it high? We'll ask them about their cholesterol level. And this is a pretty good patient, all right? Three picks. And we also ask them, whether or not they do any regular exercise. And this patient said, yes, they do a bit of, they do walking. We'll ask them about whether the weight is going up, down, or it's steady. And we ask them what foods they do not eat because of diabetes. And let me tell you something, everybody says the same thing. They all say sugar. And then we ask them whether they smoke or they don't smoke. So this is one of the, one of my patients who had been referred from the, from the eye screening program. And as you guys already know, this is the patient's right eye. This is the patient's left eye. So can anyone tell me whether this photograph is normal? Yes or no? Well, anyway, I know you're all saying no. Um, in this eye, they've got the fatty deposits there. They've got some hemorrhages. And again, in here, they've got less fatty deposits and these little red spots. So this patient has got diabetic retinopathy affecting both of their eyes. So they didn't need any treatment at this stage. So we had a conversation with this patient. We asked them, did they, we asked them, um, did they exercise? They said, yes, they did walking. We asked them, did they um eat sugar and did they eat much fat and they were saying no they didn't eat much sugar they they reduced their sugar intake they said they reduced their sugar intake and they said that they didn't eat any fatty foods all right so we sent them away and we normally review the patient six months later so six months later this patient comes back and they look like that now I don't know about you that's before six months this is six months later. It's worse, isn't it? This is worse. That's worse. This is worse. This looks worse. All right. So we really question the patient. And, and that's why I think it's very, very important to really, really interrogate. I always say to everybody in my clinic, my trainees, my colleagues that are working with me, you've got to be like Inspector Clouseau. You've got to really ask the right questions. And that is until someone says, who's Inspector Clouseau? Because they've never heard of you, heard of them. And that makes you feel very, very old. But anyway, so what I then discovered was they said that before they were diabetic or when they knew they were diabetic, they used to eat a cake every day. And then since they became diabetic and when they knew there was problems with their eyes, they reduced their cake intake to three times a week. So that was their definition of reducing their sugar intake. And then also the fatty foods that they said that they didn't eat, they did. They were frying that chicken, frying everything, frying the chicken, they were frying the fish, they were frying the meat. So they were having a really high fat diet. The patient had to go on and have treatment and we had to give them some more education about modifying their diet. And then the final thing about the exercise, the exercise that they said they did, the walking, was walking around their desk at work. Now, I don't know about you, but walking around your desk at work is hardly 10,000 steps, which is what you're supposed to do for the definition of proper walking for exercise. So we then devised a different questionnaire. We made it more colorful. We had the blood sugar here, blood pressure, cholesterol, exercise, 
and also a gauge to show about, you know, your HbA1c. And then on this bit, when they said, which foods do you not eat? And, you know, as I told you, everyone says sugar, sugar, sugar. So we asked them to then please turn over and indicate which foods you do not, which you do eat. That's right. We said to them, so when you turned it round, and I don't know whether you can see. So what we did was that we had all the fruits and veggies here. We had the carbohydrates. We had the dairy foods. We had the proteins, the fluids, and the cooking spreads and oils. And we asked them to tick every single thing that they actually did eat, all right, that they did eat. And I don't know where I'm going to move myself up the way here. And I don't know where you can see at the top, it's got like pawpaw that's ripe, hard coconut, all the naughty ones at the top, all right? You know, quite sugary sweets, sugary fruits like pineapple and mango. And at the bottom, oh yes, and we also had in here your banku, your kinky, your fufu, kokiyam, wachi, I love wachi. And at the bottom, we had like things like the mushroom, these sorts of veg. The carbohydrates that we asked them about were things like, um, you know, brown sugar, sweetened mango pulp, all the naughty ones at the top here and all the bottom here, brown bread and all of that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when we did this audit, looking at um, what our diabetic patients were eating, when they were coming to the diabetic clinic, the results were really quite revealing. Um, what we found was that in the dice sheet, we, we, in, we interrogated 50 people, 38 out of 50 of the patients, that's 76%, said that they avoided sugar or carbohydrates. That's what they said. And of the 38 who said they avoided, i.e. they didn't eat it, all of them tick something sugary or carbohydrate, high, high carbohydrate content on the diet sheet. And the 15 out of the 38 who said that they denied eating any carbohydrates actually consumed about 10 or more of the red and healthy foods on a regular basis. So they weren't quite really telling us, you know, the true picture. 12 out of our 50 patients did not avoid. They said, they, they, you know what, they confessed up, they fessed up. They said, you know what? Yeah, I eat sugar. <laughs> and, um, and the 12, who can, 12 out of the 50 who consumed those sort of like, um, who, have, who admitted to actually um, that they didn't avoid it, um, they consumed quite a high level. So I'm gonna move on to this. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not sort of like game over. You can actually modify your diet, do exercise, modify your lifestyle, and it can make a difference. And this patient did it in three months. So this is the patient's right eye in January 2019. And you can see there's lots of these fatty deposits within the retina. And after three, just three months of moderating their food, reducing their fat intake, modifying their diet and increasing the exercise, you can see that there is a reduction. It's not completely gone, but it's only just three months, but it was definitely moving in the right direction. Now, my friend, uh, Dr. Joan St. John, she's a GP with a specialist interest in diabetes. Um, and she's a co-author of this book called World Food Carbs, World Foods, and it's about carbs and calories. And what this book does, and I'm, I'm not promoting it per se, and there are lots of different things that you can get, but the reason I really like this um, book is that it shows you in, with a plate, the proportion of foods that's acceptable according to your carbohydrate index. And it's got all of our foods, like it's got your plantain. I can't tell you how tiny the fried plantain and jollof rice is actually that you would be allowed um, to have. Um, and I've got a picture of one of my other um, 
friends who who I gave that book to where she's standing there absolutely gassed with her mouth open at how much she can actually eat but it has all the foods you know that we're used to ackee and salt fish you know all your um stews your and um, our soups everything like that and it has like what the carbohydrate index is within it it's really incredibly helpful and that's the end of my talk thank you so much for your attention i hope I hope you understood what I was trying to say there. I hope it I hope it all makes sense and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evie. That was a very interesting and interactive talk. I was I was laughing in the background. I had myself muted, so you probably didn't hear me, but I found that really interesting and educative at the same time. So yes, you have made perfect sense and you've simplified it right down to our level. Um, and also taking us through a bit of an anatomy lesson at the beginning. I know. And, I yes. know. I thought I thought if, if everyone was like feeling really, you know, dozy after the week at work and it's Saturday, I'm sure I've got you all sitting up like, oh, my gosh, back at school yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> that was good. So we know exactly where the retina is and we know exactly what you're talking about. Certainly yes. not at the front of the eye. No. Back of the eye. And also very important point. I mean, amongst lots of very useful things that you mentioned, but just really emphasizing the fact that these diet, lifestyle, exercise, and our sort of general lifestyle habits make a massive difference to our diabetic control overall, and also to minimizing complications. And you talked about, you know, controlling your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your blood fats, exercise, etc. And just to link in that it can just do a healthy heart session on a Tuesday evening where we talk about diet and lifestyle and nutrition. So please do tune into those sessions or any exercise classes or nutritional, you know, educational talks that you have where you where you find yourself or where you live. And I completely agree as well about the fact that complying with our follow up, with our screening, with our treatment is very important. Um, for everyone, but more especially for us as Black African Caribbean people, because we know that sometimes we're not always forthcoming with these follow-ups. We might have concerns or questions regarding them. So that's why we've got EB with us, Dr. Evelyn Mentor, to help us answer our questions today. And that book was also a very good book as well. So yes, if you can grab it, fair enough. We're not promoting anything specifically, but as she said, if you, if you think it would be useful for you, then do feel free to grab one. Now, before we move on to the Q&A session, um, we've got a, a, an interesting twist to today's session. We have uh, someone who's got a lived experience of diabetes mellitus or type 2 diabetes, if I'm being specific. Um, and he is someone who's had diabetes or been diagnosed with diabetes, got to a stage where his diabetes was really out of control. Um, and with implementing the advice that he was given with his diet, his lifestyle, etc., has managed to make some very positive turns. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce at this point, Mr. Gordy Omolayi. Omolayi, I hope I've said that correctly. Um, yes. And he will, in the next five minutes, just tell us something brief about your personal lived experience being a type two diabetic who is now, from what I gather, in remission. So now you've been told that your diabetes is no longer active um, and you're in a good place. So very briefly, and then we'll move into the um, Q&A session. Welcome, Mr. Gordy Omalai. Thank you very much. Um, good morning to everyone. Um, just to go into it quickly, uh, in 2008, um, we went to the GP, something else completely unrelated. And for some reason, he asked that um, we should do a test and it came out to, to be that I was diabetic. I didn't even know that. I didn't have any, um, anything I would call a symptom, anything like that. So um, he referred me to do more tests and that's how my journey began in 2008. Um, I didn't quite understand what diabetes was. Um, I've heard about it, but I didn't know how serious and how horrible that disease can be. So I did the best I can, um, so I thought, because I was assigned um, a couple of dietitians who would um, show me how to, you know, to feed, what I need to eat and that sort of thing. And I thought I got the hold of it, but um, I didn't. So it went on uh, a few years after, I found that I had issues with my left eye. And I went to uh, my GP and uh, they checked the eyes and then they sent me to the hospital to say that I needed to have it, have to have it checked. And it turned out that I had uh, 
um, diabetic retinopathy, my left hand, my left eye, because I saw um, this thing that was just floating in front of my eye and making it difficult for me to read and to um, to help to, to understand or define a straight line. Anyway, um, that was when the whole thing began to register to me that uh, this is this is serious. And I had another friend who had had um, was being told that he would be uh, he would have to have uh, a kidney transplant. So all of that was a waking call for me. And my wife and I decided to we had a talk, and we decided to face diabetes headlong. So we started with my diet. Um, my wife is quite particular about what we ate, but then we had to double down here uh, to to be sure that I was eating the right things because I thought I was, but obviously I wasn't. And I remember going to um, the chemist one to collect my drugs, and then the guy pulled me aside and said, "Look, you can do yourself a lot of good if you eat only low glycemic index food." And I go, "What? What is that?" Anyway, I had to do a bit of study to understand what he meant. And so we decided to, um, to, to form a regimen and to go after this and um, to make sure that we bring this under. So um, I, I found out how, uh, my wife and I found out how to count uh, our carbohydrate. So I started, you know, had a carb count, cut down on my food size. I didn't eat a lot in the first place, but then decided to cut it down significantly and um, see what happened. Other tests that I took afterwards were not quite, um, how do I say, encouraging. Um, I began to have more tests than normal. My eye was not, there was no improvement in my eyes and sort of thing. And then, but we kept on to it, just kept um, on the diet. So uh, exercise, I have a push bike. I don't drive. I walk a lot. Um, my wife has a stationary bike at home. I'll jump on that as well to do some exercise just to bring it down. My weight was about 100 kg, brought it down to 80. Right now it's about 83. And I began to see some improvement. So last year when I went to the GP and um, I took, well, I did my blood test again. I was told that the HB1, the HbA1c, I think it's called, was at 57 and that was not good at all. Okay, so I had to do some other tests, cans and all of that. So when I went back after about three months after that, that dropped to 47. And uh, I was told that I still have some way to go. So I've kept strictly to my diet. But one thing I want to bring out here is that the diet, the exercise and the positive attitude helped me in a way that I cannot describe to bring this thing down. Uh, I also read a book where uh, I saw the blob, just the blob alone helped me to make a decision. It says, uh, take control of diabetes once and for all. And I decided that this is war and I was just going to go into it blazing. So my wife, um, she's very strict about what we eat anyway. So it was easy for her to, uh, to help me form the regimen. She's helped me so much. So now I feel a lot better. So yesterday, um, I've had a test done last week. Again, I was quite apprehensive and worried about what the result would be because every time the result came by, I was never a happy man. So um, when I was at work, when the GP called me yesterday and I, I, I picked up the phone and it goes, oh, um, I have something nice to tell you. Um, I think we're going to take you off the uh, your medication. And I go, oh, OK, are you going to change that something else or is it going worse? I said, no, 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 it hasn't gotten worse. In fact, congratulations to you. You've done very well. Uh, we've decided to um, to take away your medications. Is that too many anyway? Because I have um, I have metformin nine hundred. Uh, sorry, eight hundred and fifty milligram in the morning. Alongside with that, I have um, um, another very scary pink looking um, tablet called uh, uh, alogliptin. It scares me that one. Anyway, I have to take that alongside uh, 950, um, 850. Then I take another in the afternoon. I take another before I go to bed while, you know, checking my blood sugar constantly to be sure that I kept it under. So that's how it's been for me. Um, I checked my blood sugar. I stopped taking, well, well many years ago, I, the sugar was a no-go area for more than 10 years anyway. So it's no sugar. I didn't keep myself with um, um, juices. I stayed away from juice or fizzy drinks and anything artificial. 
I stayed away from, I drank only water, which has helped. So when she told me yesterday, she said, we're going to take you uh, off uh, your um, HBAC once. When I keep getting that wrong, but then that has reduced to below 40. And there's no, yeah, yeah, there's no reason for them to keep me going on that. So that's what she told me yesterday. It was good news. And um, she um, jokingly said to me that I was a poster boy for... Um, uh, for diabetes, I make me very happy because um, I've been quite worried about what this horrible, horrible disease was doing to my body. And when I heard that yesterday, I thought, yeah, yes, this is hurrah moment for me, but then it's not over. Um, I have a lot to wait to go because she, the first thing she said by joke was that, uh, but that doesn't mean that you go to the next ice cream store and then feed you stuff. And, go. and I said, no, my palate's for ice cream and anything that's sweet is gone anyway. So that's my story. And um, I'll be. I have another test in December to check against the alpha vet, but um, they're cutting down all of my drugs. I think she said, um, just to be on the safe side, they're just going to um, uh, allow me one tablet a day, uh, I think, after dinner. Uh, but um, I need to go to the chemist to collect that, see what it is. So that's my story. And um, I hope this touches someone to help them fight this horrible disease. You know, because it is horrible. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gordy, for sharing your story. And it it really makes it real. It brings it home when you actually have someone you can see who you can identify with, who is actually telling a story of what they've lived. And, and that's really good. Well done. You've put in so much effort and you must be proud of yourself. And well I, done to Ngozi as well. I know you've been working hard and keeping the meals tight and everything, making sure he's having the right things to eat. So that's a very good example to all of us of how, as Dr. Evelyn Mensa said, making these changes can make a massive impact um, to our diabetic story and, and prevent complications. So Dr. Mensa, just before we go into the Q&A session, I just wanna say a massive thank you to you again for that really insightful session. There are lots of comments in the chat box about how educative it's been, how useful, how interactive, how beneficial it's been. And obviously thanks to you, Gordy Omalaya as well for sharing your story with us and telling us your journey really. And I'm happy it's ending on a good note. And as your doctor said, don't give up. Well, Gordy, I mean, I think you're phenomenal, to be perfectly honest, all right? And, and diabetes and the impacts, the complications from diabetes cannot be in, un, underestimated. I know I was cracking jokes and stuff like that. It's not a jokey matter at all. Um, and, you know, just last week, um, one of my patients um, has actually gone blind in both eyes. Um, they traveled and they were away for six months. Their HB1C before they traveled was 134. And when they came back, it was a hundred and it was 180. I've never seen their cholesterol. Their cholesterol was eight. It was eight. And they've literally got irreversible blindness in both eyes. So honestly, well done to you. I applaud you. Well done for getting your HbA1c. I mean, my gosh, I'd be skipping all day. I'd be out of job actually if I had all my my patients with an HbA1c less than 40. God. Don't worry, you do you do the other eye bit, not happy. the diabetic one. I would be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you. Right. So, um, Dr. Dr. Mensa, if someone develops eye disease, Fiona wants to know, if you have eye disease from diabetes, can it be reversed? Um, I mean, you've already talked about that we can improve things, but is there a stage where things get to where it's irreversible or can it always be reversed? It can't always be reversed. Nothing's ever always, all right? If you do keep your, I mean, the longer your, your risk, your risk for, for developing advanced diabetic retinopathy is a bit like a slope, all right? Where the X, the X line, which is age, all right? The more you get older and this bit here, the Y axis is severity of the diabetic retinopathy. If you And so what you want to do is that that slope, that curve, you want to flatten it as much as possible. So for the rest of your life, you're seeing with hardly any severe eye disease, it's going to be a very steep curve if your blood sugar 
is out of control. So everything, you know what I mean? So you've got to keep, the longer you can keep your diabetes, your blood pressure under control, the more exercise you can do, the least likely it is for your diabetes to progress. But people should not worry, even if they've got diabetic retinopathy, all right, that it is at the treatment level, people should not give up. They should still continue to try and do damage limitation, keep their diabetes under good control, blood pressure good control. I've been repeating the same thing all the time. Modify your lifestyle, exercise, still have the treatment and be thankful that the treatments are available, all right? Because it's not funny being in countries you know, like where, where it's not available, you have to pay for it, all right? But still do your, do your work. You have got work to do. Okay, thank you. So the message is clear. It's an ongoing process. We've got work to do and we should keep keeping our diabetes under control. Thank you for that. Now, someone is asking, what is the HTP level? So I think what the, but we've been hearing HbA1c a lot and I think that's what the person is referring to. Yes. So, so I, we'll, we'll yes. type that in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, you, you can carry on. Oh, I was going to say we could type that in the chat box. Yes, you can. So and that... what, H, what HbA1c, right, stands for is glycosylated hemoglobin. Okay, so you've got red blood cells and within your red blood cells, you've got a molecule hemoglobin. And it's the and it's the, it's it's the it's the attraction of the glucose, the sugar to the hemoglobin in your red blood cells. Now, your HbA1c gives one an indication of your diabetes for the previous three months. Why three months is because red blood cells last for three months within your blood system. So the HbA1c is a much better indication of your long term control as opposed to doing that finger prick test. So keeping your HbA1c within the level that the GP has has decided that it should be or your diabetic, uh, your endocrinology, your diabetes specialist is what is what you need to do. I'm happy if I have a patient, I just think 50, 50 and less. I'm happy with that. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I've put the levels in the box for everyone to, to see if you want to um, capture those figures. OK, so the next question from Melanie is I'm type 2 diabetic. And when I visit the diabetic clinic, I always hear about foods to avoid that I do not eat. But they do not tell me about what cultural foods exactly. I should avoid. Exactly. Now, if you go onto the British Diabetic Association website, they have culturally specific foods that you can take and you should avoid. So the BDA, British Diabetic Association, and also on the Diabetes UK website. All right. Um, and, and, and I'm not trying to promote jo Joan's book, but seriously, it's such a good book because it has visually what the carbohydrate index is for the portions of the foods, it's on a plate and it's and it's got all of our foods, everything. All my husband's Nigerian, you know, so it'll have eforero, it'll have a gusi, you know, all the things that we like to that we you know that people that we like to eat are stews, you know, um, uh, oxtail, you know, all, all the rice and peas. It has the it has it in the proportions. And it has the uh, carbohydrate index. It's more appropriate, but you can go onto the BDA. That's free, British Diabetes Association and Diabetes UK. Okay, super. So those two are credible websites as well, where we can get our information from. Thank you for that, Doctor Mentor. Do you have the link to post in the box for us? I've just I've just put the name of the, but I haven't actually posted the link. So I'll get that for you. Yes, thank you. So if we can put the link in there for anyone who's interested. So Fiona, I hope that, Melanie rather, sorry, I hope your question has been answered. But um, so the follow on to that is I know CAN does some work on this, but not everyone knows about CAN. So CAN also has a lot of resources on various topics. And if you do contact health at can.org.uk, you can request some of these resources as well. Thanks for that contribution, Melanie. Anita, um, Dr. Menta, Anita is saying, I've just had my recent blood test results from my GP and thankfully I haven't got diabetes. However, my eyesight is really bad. My vision is so blurry, um, I, wear I wear glasses or contacts. 
I have been told I cannot have laser eye surgery because I do not qualify. So my question is, why is it that my eyesight is clear when I squint my eyes? How can how can it can't be corrected by laser surgery? So this is someone who's not diabetic, but she's got blurry vision. Um, then she's saying when she's squinting, it's clear, um, but otherwise the vision is blurry. Why is she not eligible for laser treatment? Because laser treatment to correct short-sightedness or long-sightedness is not available on the NHS. Um, if, you, if you're having to squint your eyes, you need glasses. <laughs> so if you, you've got a refractive error, it means that you're either short-sighted or long-sighted. So yeah. what you need to do is you need to go to the optometrist, get measured up, have a refraction measured up for glasses, for distance or for near. Or if you want to wear contact lenses, if you're short-sighted, then, you know, you can do that too. But ultimately, you're either short-sighted. It sounds like you're short-sighted from what you're describing. So you need glasses for seeing in the distance. You probably don't need glasses for reading. Some people do. And you just need to get it corrected with, with glasses or, and or, or, or contact lenses. And if that isn't working, then what, what's her next option? She It sounds as though she might have glasses or contact. So if we have someone who's already got glasses and you know they've got the right you know prescription but, but, and but when but when were they updated they've got to, you've got to go and have your eyes checked every two years if your if your glasses need what you need to do is you definitely need to go to the optometrist to get checked out um if you've already got glasses and you're saying that it's still blurry that you need to go back if it's more than two years it's possible that they need to be updated if you go to the optometrist and they identify that there's something else going on with your eyes, then they will send you to the hospital eye service. But because you're already aware of glasses or contact lenses, it's possible that they need to be updated. Thank you. So, Anita, that's advice for you um, to get them checked to find out if there's anything else that's going on. Um, and then the other question, my computer is playing up a little bit so again comments about what a lovely lecture and informative session etc um so really kudos kind. to you kudos Very to you good. evie um now someone is asking or rather probably a comment saying diabetic retinopathy starts to develop from pre-diabetes stage do you want to say something about that to either corroborate that or refute that please thank you so there are lots of people who are diabetic there's quite a significant proportion i think it's 800,000 in the uk who are diabetic who don't realize that they that they are diabetic um and um and so so especially for our type 2 diabetics so they can have it for up to about 5 years before they actually realize that they're diabetic. So sometimes at the point of diagnosis of being diabetic, then they had noted to have diabetic retinopathy. So unfortunately, um, they may not have had the symptoms or the signs, or they may not have been aware of the symptoms of the signs of diabetes, but you should be really, you should have a high, there should be like a red flag signal in your, you know, for our community, especially our community. And bearing in mind, in um, that the continent where there is the greatest increased prevalence in the future by 2050 is sub-Saharan Africa by about 150%. It's really, really high. So it's a real serious issue and it really pertains to lifestyle, diet, exercise, you know, all of those things, which I keep on repeating all the time. Yes. We hear these things every time, don't we? And we, even when we're talking about heart disease, kidney disease, we're talking about all sorts of different topics that we have on these Catholic Health Hour sessions. We always hear about our lifestyle, our exercise, our diet. So this is something which we need to take seriously because it has benefits across the board. It has benefits across the board. And Anne v Valentine Price is saying, I'm so happy I came to this presentation. It's definitely encouraging me to change my lifestyle. So if for nothing at all, you have saved a life today, Evie, oh, you can go blessed. home happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be going to a festival after this, happy actually. Yeah, good. <laughs> Well done. I'll be celebrating. And, and, yes, and we should we should all take this seriously and work on it. Right. So Alex Abel, um, Chuka Mecca, I can see your hand is up. I'll be coming to you in a minute, please. Alex Abel is saying, I was lucky that when I went to our diabetic clinic in Bolton, 
I had an Asian lady who had Zambian roots and she was brilliant. She told me what ethnic foods to avoid and also the importance of. So again, back to what we're saying, culturally appropriate foods, but also um, foods that are, you know, our everyday foods, which we eat, is important that we know what is helpful and what isn't. I really like that analogy you gave about everyone saying, oh no, I don't eat any sugar, I don't eat any fat. But when you actually go to the breakdown of what we're eating or how we're preparing our food, we realize that there is a lot of sugar and there's a lot of fat in there. Because automatically people just think sugar is sugar, yes. whereas we, we, we're not thinking that, you know, our carbohydrates are breaking no. down no. and all the other ways in which we prepare food might be increasing the cholesterol levels. Yeah. So Ngozi's asking, Dr. Menson, what is the normal cholesterol level? OK, so. <laughs> Uh, I'll pass that on to you. Um, what is the norm? That's probably a, a bit of a tricky one because there could be a range. But so, anyway, just yeah. a ballpark figure would be great. I like it. You know, I, you see, I'm not very good at remembering things. I, I I have to have word associations. You know how I said the figures I give are not the most accurate, but I just remember 50 and five. So I remember 50 less because, I mean, I'm skipping and I'm dancing. If my patient's HbA1c is less than 50, I know it's like up to whatever it is, 48. But I just think 50. And it's the same with the cholesterol. If it's less than five, um, I'm happy. I'm usually happy with that. I don't know what the actual, I just don't want patients with six. <laughs> you know, I just don't want it because you know what? That fat is deposited in the retina. I don't want it anywhere near there because it's really difficult to get it, you know, once it deposits in your, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, your retina is an extension of your brain. This is delicate tissue. You know, we've really got to look after it. And, and, and that's the sad thing about it is that people don't realize that all this damage is happening sometimes until it's too late. If they don't attend their screening appointments, you've got to keep your appointments screening. If you don't get your clinic appointments, be not, be banging on that door, you know, if you're already under the hospital, if you're under screening, it's been delayed. You just go and cause them grief, all right? And make sure they see you. Or call me and I'll tell them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So five is a good ballpark. Five, five. Less um, than five. Yes. And that, that's usually fair enough for total cholesterol. And then obviously there are breakdowns of different kinds of yeah. cholesterol and they have their own different reference ranges. But as Evie said, five is a good, easy to remember figure. The lower, the better, basically. Yes. 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 So um, thank you for that, Dr. Mensah. Um, Chuku Emeka Amadi, would you like to unmute yourself and very briefly and ask your question and then I'll come to Grace after that. So Chuku Emeka, please unmute yourself and ask your question. All right. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me very well? Yes, we, we can, can hear you clearly. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, what a privilege to really be part of um, this program and your organization. Um, so I've been listening to um, what um, Dr. Evelyn has been saying. Um, so I have a test result um, that was conducted sometime in July. Um, is my H hemoglobin A1C level? Yeah. yeah. So it actually said it's 41 mol slash millimoles per mole. Millimoles per mole. So those are the units of measure. That sounds like a pretty good HbA1c to me. Yeah. 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 Th thank you so much. So, well, however, th th there are comments that were made um, in the result that I I didn't quite understand. They they provided um, the ranges for the categories or ranges um, where they say it, whether it is good or fair or poor or too high, you know, as the, uh, as the case may be. So, but um, they said that an HbA1c of forty eight. MMOL per mole is yeah. recommended as a cutoff point for diagnosing diabetes. Yes. A value of less than 48 M MMOL per yeah. mole does not exclude diabetes diagnosed using glucose tests. I do not understand what that means. It doesn't exclude. Are you diabetic? I am not. So why were you having an HB1C test? So I, okay, um, so I... I decided to approach my GP to um, to have that tested. I actually, in my family, um, so many people, um, my uncles, uh, even my dad, uh, they were diagnosed with diabetes in the past. Um, so um, all of them are late right now. Um, so I decided to periodically go for um, my blood sugar level test. Oh, very good. So I, in the process of doing that, I approached my GP to help me 
included in, in some of the tests that I conducted recently. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your very useful question. You can um, you can um, sort of mute yourself now. So, so I guess you're taking your health in your hands, aren't you? And knowing that you've got to increase risk factors, you've got multiply effects, your race and your family history and all of that, you're taking initiative and you're being proactive about your health, which is a good thing. Um, so I'll, I'll hand that to Dr. Mensah um, to talk about briefly. And then I'll add on a bit um, from my point of view as a GP as well. Yeah, well, um, well, Dr. Santi will probably know more about this than me. I mean, I'm, I'm an unusual ophthalmologist, by the way, because not many ophthalmologists are bothered about patients' HbA1c's and their mm. cholesterols. It's not, it's not the, I'm not, I'm, not, it's not the norm. So, so Joan, t Joan tells me. So the thing is, is that knowing about those results are has to be in context because you, if you're a diabetic you know, who's on medication and it's that level, then that's, you know, really good, but you're not diabetic. And so, you know, some of those comments that are in the results do not pertain to you because you're not, you're not diabetic. Exactly. So that's, that's my feeling. I don't know. Uh, yeah, exactly. Know. I agree with you. And I think, I think Chukomeka possibly, so what happens when you have a, a result is, although that is your result, the, the reference comments are generic comments. So they're probably basically saying they, this is the reference range. If it's below 848, you're not diabetic, but it doesn't mean that you cannot become diabetic, obviously, because if, if things get worse, you can be. But as long as your level is below 48. So that's just a generic comment, which you'd see on anybody else's form. What is relevant to you is that your specific level was 41, which is just, just, you know, it, it, literally you're just under the normal range because between 42 and 47 is what we call pre-diabetes so diabetes we diagnose from 48 between 42 and 47 is pre-diabetes or just before you get there so as soon as we have patients who have an hba once you're 42 and above we begin to say to them you need to take this seriously apply the same measures you would do as though you were a diabetic because you don't want to become a diabetic but as far as your result 41 is concerned, that's a normal level. So all the comments there are just general comments about what the reference ranges are. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, it does. Um, but can it be much lower than 41? What it is can, actually the yes. normal range? Yes, yes. So there are people with HbA1Cs of 38, 37. So anything less 41 and less is normal. Basically, if your HbA1C is 33 or 35 or 38 or up to 41 is normal. If it's between that 42, means I need to walk harder to get it down. Yeah, Further. but you're normal. Basically, you're normal. So it's it's fine. But as Dr. Mensa said, you need to still do these things to prevent yourself, especially if you know you've got a fa family history and you've got the race factors as well. There's really a message so for if, all of us to do something about our health. If okay. I may still add, right, as GPs, right? Um, so especially for my GP. Um, when I got the result, I was expecting that the, the probably my GP would call me in for the doctor to probably explain, give me further information about you know, the test result. But there was no such thing. I was only no. called on phone. I called in to request for my test result. And then I, told, they were, I was told my, all my results say is normal. And that was it. Okay. Right? Okay. I wasn't so, really so, pleased with it. Yeah. So, so that's a relevant point. What you probably can do is phone in and find out if you if you're not understanding because of course you can appreciate on these programs we're talking about generic things we're not here to specifically talk about people's individual you know health problems or their medical records because we cannot really do that there might be so many other things that we're not aware of so we, we would only give generic advice so thanks for bringing that up I think what you probably need is speak to somebody if no one has phoned you speak to them and say can I have a bit more discussion about this? And that would be helpful. But thanks for that. Um, so I've got Thank Grace you. and Alex. And just before we carry on, I just want to crave the indulgence of everybody. If it's okay for us to extend this a bit further, Dr. Mensa, are you able to give us an extra 15 minutes or so of your yes, time? Yes, I can. Or? I can do that because I'm waiting for my daughter to get back. So where's yes, the best to go? she's not here and she's not, so I can, I can, this is very important. So I'm, okay. I'm happy to, I've got like this open door policy. So whatever oh, you. you, you want, that's absolutely, it's fine by me. Yeah. Thank you. I'm only saying that because I can see 31 messages in my chat box already. I haven't opened oh, all you? of them, so I don't know <laughs> whether they're all. Yeah, yeah, that's me. fine. It's absolutely fine. Please don't, I'm, don't worry. Yeah. Looking at the time is eight minutes past 12. That's fine. And I know we're yeah, going that's to fine. overrun. 
So if it's fine with everyone, please, we will probably have an extended session today. Um, so Grace, um, please unmute and ask very briefly, and let's keep the questions as generic and brief as possible. Any sort of personal details or, you know, very detailed bits, you can email to health at, health, health at candle.org.uk for further information. Over to you, Grace. Thank you so much. You're um, welcome. I can't thank you enough for this initiative. Now, the two questions I have. Uh, my, I always get my test result back at 6.5 HB. So what does that really mean? It doesn't come like- Good question. Or five or, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, actually a very, that's actually a very good question. And um, you know what, Ms. Grace, yeah. Um, I am going to, let me just get, I will, I'll, I'm going to just help you just now. Oh my gosh. You know what? I shut my talk. I didn't think I'd need it again. Yeah. Um, let me just, let me just show you something on my, um, sorry, because well, I, I guess, I'll explain well, to you. Oh, no, it's this well, one. Dr. Evie is getting that up. What's your second question, please, Grace? Okay. The second question is uh, about a month ago, I developed eye floaters. And I'm wondering if it's got anything to do with uh, diabetic renopathy. Okay, oh all right. So those are your two questions. Yes. Whether yes. the floaters are to do with diabetic retinopathy and yes. if your level of 6.5 is normal or not. I think yes. Dr. Mensa is trying to get a slide up. Yes, I am. Um, you, can see, to... you can see me struggling here. Yeah, yeah, because I wanted to get it big enough for you to see. Um, so I've, 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 I'm not doing it in presentation mode and I'm just magnify. Oh gosh, I've just gone a bit too. Yep. So yeah. what I'm trying to do, Miss Grace, is yes. that I'm trying to show you this scale here. HbA1c yeah. is an indicator of diabetes control. There are yeah. two ways to measure the HbA1c. You okay. can measure the HbA1c in percent. 5%, okay. 6%, 7%, 8%, all the way to 12%. All right. All right. But you can also measure it, um, as the previous um, person was asking the question, in millimoles per mole, All in right. blue. Do you understand? So right. I created, I put this in my questionnaire, and then you've got the random blood glucose here. So you said six, you're in the, Miss Grace, you are in the green. Six point, right. you said six point something, didn't you? 6.5. Exactly, here. Yeah. That's very good. That's very good. All right. Okay. okay. Okay, then. So that was my very roundabout way of actually. <laughs> <laughs> we got there in the end, didn't you we? You know what? I'm one of these people who I have to uh, make sure that everybody understands what I'm actually talking about. Thank you oh. for simplifying that. We got there in the end. So 6.5 sure. is really good. Yes. And, and also, as another simple ballpark figure, if, you, if you're sort of below seven, that's really good. Um, All right. You know, so around about seven, seven point five is okay, and then you, when yeah, it goes above yeah. that, we're so so. Have you been attending the screening program, the diabetic eye screening programs? Have you been having photographs once a year? Yes, I have, but this year they haven't called me. When was the last time? Uh, last year was around April. Around yeah. April, and so we're in August now. So you yes. need to contact the diabetic eye screening program. I don't find... have their number. I've been trying to, to, to get them. And they've not, they've not contacted no, you? No, because I developed eye floaters. So if you've got eye floaters, what you need to do is you need to go to your GP, all right? Yeah. Get them to refer you to the hospital eye service. Or if you, you can go to an optometrist. There are some optometrists who can do direct referrals to the hospitalized service, not all of them. Don't let them charge you money for scans and pictures and all that sort of stuff, all right? Yeah. You come to the hospitalized service and we will we would have a look at you there and see what's going on, okay? Yeah. Have you got flashes of light? No, no. Just the floaters. And how, yes, how many, on, my, on my right, right eye. Right, and how many floaters are you noticing? Um, just notice what, it, initially I thought it was my hair. Yes, so it might be, it might not be anything to do with the diabetes, all right? Yeah. It may not, it may just be degeneration of the jelly in the eye, yes. okay? And yes. that can cause floaters. So it may not be anything to worry about. So don't panic. I'm not worrying by that single one hair floater that you're describing, yes. Yes. but you should still get it checked out. Okay. Don't let them charge you for, don't let them sell you a pair of glasses. 
Yes. yes, but I'm sorry, I'm Thank being you. a bit too too much now. Please, just one more question. Mm -hmm. My feet, I always have um when whenever I've had sugar, I have pain in my in my in my uh, feet. So yeah, right. some pain in my feet. Right. I'm sorry. That probably that's something we'd need to take a bit more history on, isn't it? Yeah. to find out because I mean yeah. for someone to have sugar and instantly have pain in the feet may, may be a bit tricky to work out what would need to happen is for for someone to take a, a good history to find out the nature of the pain the location yeah. what the you know the features are so that's probably the sort of thing that you could either phone one of us on the CAN helpline and um, can one of the digital okay. assistants okay. put the CAN helpline number in okay. there for okay. Mrs Thank Grace you. Right. Um, and then we can talk about that in more detail or you oh. can better speak to your GP about that. Yeah. But thank you so much for your contribution, God bless Grace. You for what you're doing. Thank God you. God bless you. <laughs> OK, thank you so much. All right. All right. right. So I've got quite a few more questions. Um, Dr. Mensa, so someone's comment, I've not been tested for diabetes since pregnancy, um, but I was not diabetic. That was 17 years ago and I've never been tested since. So she wasn't diabetic and she said she's not been tested for, for the last 17 years when she was pregnant. I keep getting styes and inflamed eyelids and I wondered whether there is a possible link to diabetes. No. Should I get checked for diabetes because of no, that? No, it's not linked to diabetes at all. If you're uh -oh. getting that, you're talking about a um, condition in your eyelid where your lashes are, all right? So... If you go on to the um, RNIB website, RNIB, just type RNIB and type in this word called blepharitis, which I'm going to put in the chat, um, blepharitis. It's possible that you've got blepharitis, inflammation of the lid margin, and that can predispose you to getting styes and lumps, little cysts on your eyelids. And it'll explain to you how to do lid hygiene, but it's got nothing to do with being diabetic. My phone, I, I went off very briefly, thanks for that. Okay. Um, and just along that thread, it, so we talked about floaters a lot. Can you tell us briefly what floaters are and, and what sorts of things could cause floaters or flashes sometimes we hear? So just very briefly, please. Yeah. So inside the eye, at the back of, in the middle part, you know, when we were doing our anatomy lesson at the start of this session, we talked about the front of the eye. We talked about the back of the eye, the retina lining in the middle is a jelly called vitreous, all right? Now, everybody's got a little bit of floaters. If you look up at the sky against, you know, a, a light background, you might see these very faint gray wiggly worm type things, dots floating about. And that's just degeneration of that vitreous jelly. And that's what floaters are. They're just collection of collagen fibers. It's degeneration of the jelly. The, the reason to be concerned about you know not it not it not being standard floaters is if you get a lot of floaters like a shower of dots like 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 snow falling like hundreds and thousands lots of different floaters with flashes of light because that could either mean that the vitreous jelly is detaching or it could be your retina detaching and when that happens you do have to have that checked either at the optometrist or in the hospital eye service. Don't go to the GP for them to examine their eyes because they'll, <laughs> they're not used to looking at people's eyes, but you can go to them to do the referral, all right, to get your eyes checked out, to make sure that there is no tear or detachment of the retina. But the usual reason for flashes and floaters is the jelly pulling at the back of the eye, but you still have to get it checked out. Okay, And that is something we should be concerned about or not? Yes, you if should this be. is serious, it should yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, you should be yeah. concerned. You should be concerned about, and it needs to be checked out. You okay. shouldn't ignore it. Good. So, so it's important that we don't ignore these things. And yeah. I, is it relevant whether it's a gradual onset or a sudden onset? Or, it can or, be or sudden. Should you just get it checked? It, it can be. You should just get it checked. The, okay. the issue in somebody who is diabetic 
who's known to have diabetic eye disease is sometimes the floaters can be blood bleeding inside the eye. So if you're a diabetic who's known to already have diabetic retinopathy, you need to go and you're already under the hospital eye service. You need to go. You need to contact them immediately if you suddenly get floaters because they need to exclude something called a vitreous hemorrhage bleeding of abnormal blood vessels into the eye. This is for people who are already under the hospital eye service for their diabetic eye disease who are having continuous monitoring. Because unfortunately, once you have diabetic retinopathy, it's lifelong care. It's yeah. lifelong care for monitoring or screening. Thank you. So the message is crystal clear on that one. Thank you for that. Now, Mandy has also uh, made a comment. She said, we definitely need the local diabetic clinics to take cognizance of our ethnic diets. Definitely applauding you guys and the medical practitioners who come on board on the various health topics. So she's saying she's really enjoying this and she's learning a lot. Um, yes, because, because, with, because people, you see, what happens is people who are specialized in different parts of the eyes, they focus on that thing. You've got to, you, I mean, when I'm seeing a patient, I'm not taking their eyes and sticking them on the slit lamp and examining them. I'm looking at them holistically. So you've got to take everything that they're doing into the, the disease condition that you're monitoring and you're looking at. It has to be holistic type of, you know, joined up kind of medicine, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Alex, um, Abel, can you unmute yourself and briefly ask your question? Can we be really brief and straightforward with these questions so that other people have a chance as well? Alex, Abel, thanks for your patience. Your hand has been up for quite a while. <laughs> right. So Alex, Abel is my husband, but I'm Mandy. It doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, Mandy, go on then. Again, thanks ever so much. Uh, and you are all so articulate and very clear. Nothing like your medical terms that's what i like about it oh, thank you. you know right the right level as well yeah so one of the things um i have to very very quickly what i wanted to say is i know you've talked about websites that you can have this uh, information but you should realize that as the uh, over True. 60s yes we don't take no. no i agree i already know what you're going to say madam I know what you're yeah. going to say. So what I would say, what I would oh. say is that in most, in libraries and in mm -hmm. most, I think some GP practices and in the diabetic clinics, yeah, there should have... be literature. There should be yeah. a hard copy literature yeah. that you yeah. can access. So you need mm -hmm. to ask them. And also, I know I talked about websites and things like that, but you, there's usually one young person, one grandchild, one niece, one nephew, all right, who can also order some of these things for you, especially with the information from the Desmond, you know, the Daphne and the Desmond courses. They have yeah, a lot yeah. of resources and they, mm -hmm. could, and they can be posted to you, I'm sure, if you don't have access yeah. uh, mm -hmm. to computers or, or devices. So there's always somebody that knows. You're using your husband's mobile phone. I'm sure there's some <laughs> other... <laughs> no, no. So one of the things why I'm saying it is at the moment, um, and actually it was on the uh, thing of Cannes, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a, a universities, two universities, one in Scotland and one, I think, in the south. They are looking at, into uh, the use of that. One of the things they are we are worried us that a lot of the things are now going online. No, I agree right? with you. Yeah. Madame. I so, agree. Yes. Yeah. And I agree. So what I was trying to say is, yeah, so, and Cannes is is also leading yes. on that as well to say and i'm i'm happy to hear that because i am i am very passionate about um digital they talk yeah. about digital inclusion yeah. and yeah. Digi digital deprivation and i ask my trust this question every single time yeah how many of our patients how many of our of the patients that we are responsible for have digit are digitally competent I mean, yeah when you're sending out that digital letter how do you know the device that the, that the patient has got that they're going to be able to open it's it? It's compatible. Exactly. Know? Well, I am very compassionate in that respect because as you can imagine, my I'm patients- I'm so glad. I'm so yes, glad. Because they've got difficulty with their eyes. So we have, we tend to tend, we send, we tend to send the letters out actually for a lot of our patients, some reminders, some telephone calls, but you're quite right. These things, these digital things have to be taken into consideration. So yeah. please don't worry. And you've mm -hmm. got Khan, you're lucky. 
Yeah. So back. the other thing was, um, I, okay, I am a type two diabetic. I've had COVID, and I wonder because there's not a lot of information about the effects. They're still learning about COVID and its effect to the body. Being a diabetic and having gotten COVID, will it affect even you more? I mean, uh, what do I say? Will what advert, adverse effects? of COVID to a diabetic patient. Do you know, do, how will it, will it affect us more adversely than say a person who isn't? That's what I wanted to, to know. I'll give that because, to, um, because at the moment I have got problems on one of my, it only happened the time I tested positive and a day later I was walking and my side of my leg uh, no, my foot, sorry, one side. It's numb. It's still numb. You know, like you can feel it and there's a hard skin. It's, they tell me it's a nerve. That's what my doctor said. It was a nerve or something. They weren't sure whether it was actually a diabetic or it was because of COVID. Man, they said it's going to go. But I am still worried as a diabetic, you know, how feet can get, you know, because both my dad had... Um, and both amputations. So, <laughs> so I'm really, I get, I'm worried. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Thank you for sharing your concerns as well. Dr. Mensa, um, what would you like to comment on that, please? If, if you're able Well, to. you're describing possible peripheral neuropathy. And I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a diabetic doctor. I'm a diabetic eye doctor. Right. Ah. Uh, Yes. Yeah. So, um, so my my speciality is 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 ophthalmology eyes. and eyes. But what yeah. we do know from COVID is that people who had COVID and they had other um, systemic, underlying yeah, yeah. underlying um, conditions, um, they did. It, it was a bit of a challenge. It was a little bit difficult, and things were a bit worse, and you know, for them. But um, in terms of your symptoms that you're describing, it's not my area of expertise, area yeah, yeah but it yeah, sounds yeah. like you're describing a peripheral a bit of a slight degree of peripheral neuropathy which is uh -huh. one of the complications of diabetes and, I, and whether it's linked to COVID or not I don't know because I'm not that's what the doctor said as well yeah. oh, well you need to believe in your doctor <laughs> <laughs> believe in your doctor it's thank because... you so much Mandy you <laughs> thank can you you thank can you. Unmute, you can mute yourself now I yeah. mean thank okay. you that was really good it's good when we have these interactions um so that it brings life to the session as well and thank you for that also dr mensa fidelia would you like to unmute yourself and briefly ask your question and then we can feel the rest of the question okay, so that yes, would be my, the last meeting yes my question is this floaters can mm -hmm. it be operated upon no you don't you don't operate on what what i would call physiological floaters i.e part of your normal eyes if it's physiological i.e. it's just degeneration on, on your eyes. But if you've got floaters for another disease, i.e. bleeding inside the eye, and it doesn't clear up, that might need an operation. Not all the time. It might need laser treatment or it might need an operation. So not all floaters require an operation. It's a normal thing. It might be normal. A bit like your hair going gray, unfortunately, all right? Um, you know, you can dye it and change it from gray to black or brown or whatever. But when you've got just physiological, part of your eye floaters, unfortunately, um, that's the way it is. And what normally happens if it's just part of the normal degenerative process of the vitreous jelly is that when it happens the first time, over time, it will just settle down. Your brain will learn to ignore it and it won't notice the floaters so much. Thank okay, you for those questions. Okay, just a, 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 what, a, just a second, please. What about those with glaucoma? And you've done, um, maybe you've done laser so, surgery. Yeah, well, your glaucoma is a different eye disease and you actually have a glaucoma specialist. You know what? You guys are so lucky because my friend, Adana is a glaucoma specialist and she's coming to speak to you at the beginning Good. of next year. All right. So you'll have a proper conversation with an ophthalmologist because as small as the eye is, as small as it is, we all specialize in different parts of the eye. It's the biggest speciality 
in outpatients in, in the NHS, but we all specialists. I'm not going to talk about glaucoma because I'm talking about diabetic eye disease today. But okay. you, you wait, you're going to have someone coming to speak to you about that very soon. And so, Fidelia, keep tuned in because sessions will be coming up. And as um, Evie has said, specifically glaucoma will be addressed. And thanks well, thank for that. Thank you so well, much. Dr. Thank you so thanks. much. You're welcome. Thanks to everyone who's unmuted and contributed. Um, Dr. Men said, so, OK, so Tolu S has uh, made a comment to say, yes, COVID and type 2 diabetes outcomes are worse and can lead and accelerate complications. So we, we know that generically COVID makes a lot of things worse. And if you've got underlying diseases, then you're probably at a higher risk. But as Dr. Mensa said, we cannot give any specific facts and figures on those uh, unless they're actually sort of proven. Um, there is also a comment um, to say thank you for the session. OK, let me go to the questions. So, so there was another person who'd asked a question. She said she joined late and could diabetes be reversed? So, yes, Dr. Mensa has said if we eat healthily, watch our diet, exercise, we can really make some massive progress to our diabetic control. My computer's playing up. I'm trying to find the next question. Um, right. So Dr. Mensa posted something about blepharitis. I think she was referring to the lid disease. Yes, yes, that's right. So um, he's asking about the cysts on the eyelid. Let's yes. have a look. I don't, know. I don't know if I've missed any of the questions. I'm just going through quickly to have a look and see. I suspect we've answered almost all the questions. And, and even as we've sort of done the interactions, other things that we we've touched on would have addressed people's concerns as well. Um, so I'm hoping that we have addressed everybody's concern. Somebody and... somebody's asked about Reddit GIs and they asked me directly. Okay. Um, All right. And um, and the thing is, is that Reddit GIs is usually um, it's usually hay fever eyes. You can get drops for hay fever across the counter. So if you go to a good chemist red itchy eyes are, is usually hay fever sometimes with a bit of dryness so if you go to the chemist to get um drops for hay fever antihistamine drops for hay fever and you could also get lubricating drops just to make the eyes feel comfortable thank you thanks for that okay and just a second please sorry um, can we get these slides because i joined in late Okay, you, you, you can, yes. We, we can uh, share the slides and you can also contact health at can.org.uk. You can be muted now, thank you. Um, so someone wants to know, Theresa wants to know, what can people who cannot exercise due to health reasons, what can they do? Um, well, well, it depends on your definition of exercise because most people can walk. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you can just, and it doesn't have to be at a fast pace per se, but even walking, I think the recommendation is 10,000, but I mean, you just start off slow and you just build up from there. So even just, mo be, just moving, walking should be enough. Yes, and I'm sure most people can at least do something. I think on one of the uh, exercise sessions, we had someone talk us through about how we could do exercises, even if you're immobile, if you, even if you're sat down, even if you're sort of bed bound, there's certain things that you might be able to do yeah. seated or from a wheelchair or from a not very mobile position. So there are things that can be done, as, as Evie said, and, and let's try. Every little helps yeah. as one of the shops. Like armchair so, exercises. I know we have a, one of the things I wanted, sorry, very quickly, I do, I do beg your pardon. I think can also, if you could look into uh, setting up some groups, but that, I mean, this is for later, setting up groups within towns, like in Bolton, we don't have anything. I know that uh, in Manchester, there's um, a group that does Tai Chi, tai chi uh, armchair exercises and so on, and for uh, the over 55s. And if there was that encouragement of people within communities that can set up those groups i mean it would also be good because we could meet people some people are on their own and you yes. know and so on and talk about diets and bring in somebody who mm. can tell us about diets that, that to me i would really love to you know to have something like that 
Okay, okay, that's a very valid point. Thank you, thank you. So we we can look into that, can um, and see what we can get. Now our time is far gone. It's twelve thirty three, um, and I know that if we could spend the whole day talking about diabetic eye disease, but there has to come a point where we say you know we draw the curtain on the on the program we must say a massive massive thank you to dr evelyn mentor our consultant ophthalmic surgeon these people are really busy she's taken time out of a busy schedule uh, to come and spend a saturday morning with us and talk us through diabetic eye disease it was very very practical it was simple for everyone to understand and we even had a feedback on that saying how easy it was to understand and we're all leaving here with something we're all leaving with a message we're all leaving equipped we're all leaving educated we're all leaving a better person and even if it doesn't apply to you you know somebody who has diabetes some relative some friend somebody in the community so dr mentor we want to say thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure having you I've enjoyed every bit of this. I've learned a lot as well, although I'm a GP. I've learned a lot more as well. So we always learn things on these sessions. That's and really I hope your good. festival is great. Oh, thank you. And thank you so much. Lovely, lovely people. I've really enjoyed my morning. I'm going to add a few more slides to my slides. I'll have, I do have slides with the um with alternative um food. Uh, websites it's got all the information for that and I will put that I will put that in that slide in the slides and I'll and don't worry I won't quiz you again but thank you so much for having me enjoy the rest of your Saturday thank you okay. and thank you to the team um working behind the scenes um who, who make this program a success thank you for Mr Gordia Omalaya as well who shared his experience it's been my absolute pleasure hosting you my name is Dr Diana Asante and thank you for your time. I hand over to Sandy to do the closing. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Asante. Thank you very much, Dr. Evelyn. It was a, it was a real pleasure to have you. Um, so on behalf of Khan, again, thank you. I'm going to share some updates, um, event uh, sessions we have upcoming. So the first session um, is our next health hour on Saturday the 27th of August at 11, same time. And the topic, as you can see on the flyer, um, anesthesia or being put to sleep, um, sounds like a very interesting topic. So our guest speakers will be Dr. Regina uh, Graham and Dr. Christopher Williams. So please do not miss it to register, email us at event at can.org.uk. Um, our next session um, is the Healthy Heart every Tuesday. Every Tuesday um, from 6 p.m. till 7.30 p.m. So the next session will be about nutrient intake. So what, what feeding practices do you use in your home, uh, really? So feeding infant and young child, right, will improve their survival and promote healthy growth and development. So if you'd like to know more, please join us on Tuesday, the 20, uh, 23rd of August um, at 6 p.m. And the guest speaker will be um, a PhD student, Lauren Senior. Again, you can email us to register at event at can.org.uk. Okay, and uh, Black History Month is on the way, October. It's, um, it's just around the corner. So please do join us to celebrate um, our Black History Month. This will be on the 20, 28th of September. Um, again, for more information, please do email event at can.org.uk. And this year, again, celebration will be at Manchester Cathedral. Okay, and um, the gala is coming back. We're celebrating the gala this year. Unfortunately, last year we couldn't. So we're celebrating our fifth annual gala anniversary to fundraise for Black History Month. And this will be on the 22nd of October from 5.30 p.m. So please purchase your ticket if you haven't. If you're coming with your colleagues, please do purchase your tickets now. Um, I think the tickets are going down pretty fast. So uh, yeah, <laughs> early birds are recommended. So uh, we also have a few services at Cannes. We have a family and advocacy service. Um, please, for more information, email um, advocacy at cannes.org.uk. We also have a domestic and sexual violence uh, service. Um, again, please email uh, dvsa at can.org.uk. Um, and same for counselling service. We have an amazing counselling service. Please do email us for more information or call our helpline on 07710 
And just to thank our partners quickly. So Can, uh, I'm sure you all know Can, but just a quick reminder, we are a black led organization set up to address the wider social determinants to eradicate health disparities for Caribbean and African people in the United Kingdom. We work with the black community across and cross sector organizations to build community resilience, relationship and social movement to improve health outcomes for black people. Um, so please do contact us for more information or visit our website. A quick acknowledgement to our partners uh, for this CATE program. So we have the Black Health Initiative, and this is their website, www.blackhealthinitiative.org. Um, and it's a community engagement organization working towards equality of access to health and social care. So please, again, um, do visit their website to understand what they do. Um, a massive thanks as well to Croydon BME Forum. Uh, the forum is the umbrella organization for Croydon's black and minority ethnic uh, voluntary and community sector, engaging people, building capacity, and promoting equality and cohesion. So again, visit their website on uh, www.cbmeforum.org uh, and the contact person, Sharon, Sharon Naruda. Okay, and next organization, again, massive thanks, Enfield Caribbean Association. Um, this is a small charity with big ideas based in London, both of Enfield and provide services and social events uh, for the local community. Again, please visit their website, www.enfieldcaribbeanassoc.org.uk. A contact person is Dion. Um, and um, we next have the Royal Assembly Redeemed Christian Church of God. Um, again, thank you very much. Um, so it's, uh, they're committed to making positive impact in our immediate community, even to the broader, uh, broader society. Uh, to this end, um, they have different community-based programs and, and outreach. Visit their website on www.theroyal-assembly.org. So yeah, the um, and last but not least, RAFA International Development Agency. So RAFA engages in partnership activities with local, regional and national stakeholders to embrace the challenges and opportunities associated with the integration and development of people, principally from Africa and the Caribbean, uh, but from other destinations, uh, destinations nationally and internationally. They're based in Birmingham and support people through early stage support, technical assistance, and program development projects uh, through which they enable individuals, groups, <clears throat> and local um, communities to build capacity and tackle issues such as health and well being inequalities, learning and skills, and youth development. Um, again, please do contact Rafa. The, the, well, they, they have their contact details on the website, and the website is www.rafa.org.uk. So this is everything from myself on behalf of Khan. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you to our doctors and thank you very much for giving your time on a Saturday morning. Okay, have a, have a beautiful weekend. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CAFIB Health Hour. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to Black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our Black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members, such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more.
We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our Black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our Black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund.